Thank you, uh, Taste audience, organizers, uh, distinguished speakers who are here today. Since we last met, you know, last July, I wondered what Taste was about. And what I'm noticing is it, it helps me when there are mavericks, there are other, uh, you know, there are musicians, poets, scientists, people from many different areas who are pretty substantial. They come together, they, they share, and it does something that's, uh, that helps us in the wine industry. It helps us, I think, with an asset that needs to be built up, and I think that's entrepreneurship. We have a lot of assets in the business. We have our property, so you could invest in our properties. We've got great vineyards here in the Napa Valley. We've got capital. We're rich here in the Napa Valley and in the wine industry. We have a lot of resources to get more resources. We have capital. We have HR. HR is great. We have some famous winemakers, just really substantial wine people. Most of the wine knowledge in the wine industry, in the California wine industry, resides within the industry itself. We're really not uh, you know, fully dependent on an academy or another institution. It's very entrepreneurial here. Originally it was, but one area that we could use some help in, I think, is entrepreneuring. And we have trouble with certain issues in agriculture. Agriculture, the community, living in the agricultural community is very conservative. One of the unspoken uh, rules is if it's good for my neighbor, uh, that's okay as long as it's also good for me and the tide will rise for me too. Uh, but if it's good for my neighbor and they're getting ahead, you know, I don't know if I'm for that, you know, I don't know if I can support that. And so when you get to origins, I'm, I'm, I kind of, I've realized I'm in the middle of this talk, origins, the origins for us are Appalachians. And uh, one of the things that we have trouble with is using the idea of quality with Appalachians. It's almost an impossibility for us. So I thought what I would do is talk, last time I talked about the chemistry of wine, I talked about how I could link the chemistry uh, of a bottle of wine to the, you know, performance metrics, like it could be consumer metrics of price, volume, it could be the national critic scores. Uh, it, it's really doable. It's, it's, uh, it's part of a, of a larger quant movement within the United States to quantify everything. What about classification, though? Classification, I don't need any chemistry to talk about classification. Um, I'll talk about, uh, first, that the Americans in 1978 created uh, sort of a base map here in Napa Valley for classifying the valley, and that was the ABA system. It started in 1978, it's progressed to this day. The most recent appellation, I think, is Yauntville. I'm not sure. Does anybody, anybody know, is that true? Raise your hand. What is it? Oak Knoll, it's Oak Knoll. Um, all right, so it's Oak Knoll. So the, uh, the AVA system continues to come forward, and the idea was that we, the trusted sellers, this is the old model, we, the trusted sellers, would bring this AVA model to you, uh, the public. And this created, actually, the opposite of what we thought it would create. We, it created an information void, because the more we knew about the AVAs, the more there was a culture of covering up what we knew. We knew there were some AVAs that were better than the other AVAs. But if you were in Safeway in St. Helena and you said, you know, I was just out in public and I was on a sales trip and I decided that uh, Stag's Leap was the best AVA. Well, you probably have trouble shopping at Safeway in the, in the vegetable aisle with winemaker from the Diamond Mountain AVA. So Appalachians, uh, the media decided, this is a quote from Matt Kramer, much can be said about these American er uh, viticultural areas. Uh, indeed, much has been said, and only rarely has it been favorable. Suffice it to say that it's simple fence building according to what the media can see, what, what really substantial writers can see. Because the Americans, uh, unlike in France and Italy, have decided not to regulate themselves. We like a much more open, laissez-faire business environment to operate in. So now we have the classification before the classification. I believe that the classification of the Napa Valley and of California is already underway. Uh, last, last year I said that I had given a talk in Temecula and they expected me to say, Temecula, you have done a great job here. And then I would give my talk to the growers. And in fact, not even one of the wines in the previous year was rated in the Wine Spectator. So with the American media uh, and, this, um, and this information void, the American media compare and calibrate everything you know, wit to wine, they're, they're going to calibrate it, and they 
love to classify, but we love to resist classification, codification. Is it largely for business reasons? I'm not sure, but the media has decided to fill the void, and they filled it with copy, they filled it with scores, and 100-point scores were chosen by consumers who empowered this system of ratings, and that replaced the AVA system uh, for, you know, in the current period, I would say the AVA system is not used by the media or the public. So today's market model uh, is new, like it or not, uh, read them and weep, uh, there's sort of this idea that we've got the national critics, the U.S. national critics, they're certainly acknowledged uh, uh, in Europe. I was talking, if I can mention, Adam Lechmere was saying that every, every so many years that comes up at decanter, should they use the 100-point scale? Absolutely not. That's very American. We wouldn't want to do that. And uh, so this 100-point scale is, is seen and is a particularly American contribution to wine. And it does something for origins. It, it acts as a currency to tell you that you could use the score instead of the origins instead of the AVA map. That's quite interesting, uh, that the public has uh, taken to the score more than the AVA map. The critics' ratings now are tied to consumer prices. Once that occurred, once the behavior of the, of the consumer starts to favor one information source, it starts to drive operations within the wine, within wine country. So, uh, this is a quote from the 1855 classification of Bordeaux. Commerce, like all human endeavors, imposes its own order on events to explain its past actions, to simplify its future undertakings, and really to reduce the risk to investment, to risk to investing in something. The 1855 classification of the Gironde wines was the result of just such a process evolving with the region's trade as it developed over time. And it's human nature to try and fashion order out of chaos, which an agricultural zone really is. I mean, I feel that I don't quite understand, for example, Paso Robles. I think I will, but I think I need someone to go and, and fashion uh, some information for me. So let's look at Bordeaux. The Bordeaux classification is a classic, traditional quality rating. Uh, this type of rating is usually a five-point scale, no more, in dairy, it's uh, really a three-point scale. There's triple A butter, you know, there's A butter and bulk butter. Uh, meats are classified, uh, aged meats in a, in a similar way. And these, this five-point scale has made Bordeaux a very, very powerful region in France. They have the highest wine prices, uh, and where there are no ratings in France, uh, we, we don't have as much power, for example, in the Rhone. Uh, they're not you know, remiss here either. They name names. They'll name the five top brands within the Appalachian system. Uh, this is something I think that we're not prepared to do here in the United States. How could we, how could we do this? How, is this ever going to happen in, in, uh, in the Napa Valley? Criticisms of the rating system, uh, of using a classification system. This is uh, talking about Robert Parker. Many critics, including Parker, believe that the 1855 classification is out of date and that a reclassification would be in the interest of consumers. Apart from being out of date, the classification was based entirely on wine prices. I think his sense is it should be based on taste. Since 1855, Chateau have uh, been bought and sold. Prestigious winemakers have died. Uh, many more important changes have occurred. In 61, the French government decided to review uh, the whole, whole situation and uh, maybe bring more functionality, delete 17 Chateau, and this just couldn't be done. In the end, the proposed reclassification was resisted, never happened because it wasn't good for the wine business, for, uh, for purely business reasons, financial reasons. Even with all the criticism, it's still generally agreed that the first growths measured in 1855 were done pretty well. And what I find interesting about that is it's a bit of an economic museum, France. When you classify something in 1855, that's before large companies, before uh, Fifth Avenue, before marketing. Before marketing tries to change the origin's value by adding more than you deserve. Marketing is a bit adding more than you deserve to something. So that's sort of the modern way. Could we, could we do something with an origin, an Appalachian, Napa Valley, should we be getting more than we deserve by, by marketing? 
So how about the accidental classification of 2006? So I, I sat in my uh, office with a couple winemakers, and uh, we were talking about this. And I had ignored this, and someone, someone said, you're really you know, behind the curve. That came out November 15th, and I hadn't read it until January. And I opened this up, and it contained, just this single media periodical contained 8,000 bottled wine statistics for Napa Valley alone, 14 vintages. Uh, it was just a mountain of data, and I thought, well, this could be used to classify the region, we really wondered, with these statistics, uh, we got a base map that were, was used and supplied by Vestra. Vestra created all the AVA maps here in the United States. We got their base map without anything on it, and we decided we would put it up on the computer screen, grab an Excel spreadsheet, and crunch the numbers and see what we came up with. And it was a simple matter of connecting existing ratings, 8,000 market metrics, they're purely consumer metrics. They're not what I do. I'm, a, I'm into producer-based ratings. I like to take winemaker, regional winemaker tastings, see if it jives with the chemistry, uh, look within my region with the regional winemakers and see, can we judge wines within our region? And we can. It's, we do it routinely. Uh, but what would happen if we didn't use any producer-based information, we just used consumer information? So we took Napa Valley trailing average price, quality, and volume. And our plan was this. Could we sum all the scores for each appellation, each AVA, Rutherford, Oakville, all of these uh, AVAs, uh, Pope Valley, I mean, everything, put it all together in a sum and come up with a ranking. And we'll take a look. So we have the base map. And think of this, what, we'll put the names up here soon, which colored square here is the best? Does someone have a sense of the Napa Valley? I think some people probably do. Do people have any sense of where the best wines come from without putting names there, without adding the marketing? Now we'll add the marketing. And you can see uh, that we've got, I think all the AVAs are here. Uh, we've got Carneros here at the bottom. Not working. All right, you've got uh, Carneros here at the uh, at the bottom. It's close to the bay. The bay is down here at the just a few miles south, maybe two or three miles. And we've got uh, Howell Mountain at the top, Diamond Mountain. So let's look and see where the numbers place the first, second, third, fourth, and fifth growths of the Napa Valley. Which AVA produces more high-scoring wines? Again, these are the ingredients. And what comes out of the hat? What comes out of the hat is that if you work with this just purely statistically, there is a premier crew area with vastly more high scores than any other region, and that's Oakville. As you move north, you uh, move into a second growth area. As you move farther north, there's a quality drop-off. Now, that should never be said. I, I couldn't give this speech if there were any, too many winemakers in the, in the audience. But there, there, you move to fourth growths and then fifth growths. As you move south, you move to second growth, Stag's Leap. And as you move into Yonville, it's really unclassified territory. Mount Veter is really unclassified. There's not enough information or fine wine being awarded by the, this particular media periodical. Ah, you go to Carneros, there's actually some statistics for Carneros, shock, that was a shock to the system. Uh, and then we're unclassified out here. And what you can see is that the hillsides surrounding Napa Valley must be more challenging, must have more issues, and it's harder to make great wine there. It's easier to make wine here at the center in Oakville. What would happen if we waited the scores for volume produced. So we take the sum of all the points pushed out by brands, but some brands, especially in the Stag's Leap area, produce tiny, tiny amounts of fine wine. Yes, they score, they have some really entrepreneurial companies, but 
the volumes are low. If you weight it, you can see that Oakville remains as the Grand Cru, the, I mean, the premier crew area, that Rutherford drops to a third tier. We go to fourth and fifth. And that south of the premier crew, we drop to fifth. And that from a weighted average basis, it says that Oakville is the center. And I, I simply didn't know this until we crunched these numbers. Now, these, these numbers, would they be useful in the hands of the consumers or the buyers? Yes, they would be very, very useful. Would we have widespread support to do this? No. <laughs> and is this an issue? Yes. And is it a challenge? We'll scale up the problem here. Quite challenging. Uh, is it a problem? Of course. Winemakers complain about the national critics all the time. They've had it, and they're not going to support it, they're not going to get involved with it, and they're not going to entrepreneur in this area. And one thing that I'm getting out of taste is that it's possible to give this talk here. Now, it might be possible to find equally like-minded, independent individuals from another industry who might be able to lend us a hand. That seems reasonable. I've been in the wine industry for over 30 years, 35 years, and my sense is that in agriculture, we do not entrepreneur. We are conservative. The mullahs of wine are always walking around in Safeway. And <laughs> it's very difficult to talk about these issues without offending someone. And, and these are our neighbors. Our, our children go to school together. This is farming. It, these aren't uh, corporations with many layers of many functions, with a lot of middle management. So this is our challenge. How do we connect the dots with other people who might show us the way? And this is very, very important, because scores and ratings and quality is a proxy that the consumer is going to choose to use unless we're willing to empower him with more information and rate our regions, our origins. If we did, what would happen to the ratings, the National Critics ratings? I believe they would lose their stature. That's a good thing. Now we have producer-based ratings. Now it feels like what's happening in France. And so what if we had to choose? And this was very difficult. I returned with my slideshow today. It said, fill in the name here, uh, where it was Camus and Robert Mondavi Winery and Opus One. It said, fill in the name. I didn't dare show this. I thought, well, I'll go all the way. Uh, there might be mullahs here. You know, this is dangerous to do this, and I kid you not. So Camus, Robert Mondavi Reserve, and Opus One, if you use just that periodical, those are the winners. Though we only have three first growths. Now, we, you know, we would need to investigate this a little further. This is like a, uh, doing the, the classification on a napkin in a restaurant. No classifications allowed. I think that's what's really up. I think there is that feeling in the crowd among people who are in the wine business. Uh, any, any people in the wine business here? <laughs> uh, how many have heard the classification this year? No one. No one's for classifying. So this is, you know, a real challenge for us. Classification, what can we do about crossing boundaries? Uh, we're in the wine business, art and business. Can we get this done individually, alone within the wine industry? No. It, it takes more independent, like-minded people that we might be able to meet at a TED-like conference. I think this is uh, the reason to have another taste for the wine industry. I'm really slow on the uptake. I always thought I was, you know, quick. And I thought, I didn't get it. What was last year about? I kept asking myself that as I drove away. And now I get it. I think it's about bringing in elements and new functionality to what we, what we all do. We could each get something when we come to these conferences. You know, I might, my pain might be a solution for you. Your solution might be something I need. So tomorrow's classification, you know, might really benefit. I think it's coming. And thank you so much.